Hello. Hello, young lady. I have to see how my background looks here. I've cleaned up a couple things. My background <laughs> is hopeless. Yours is hopeless. <laughs> hopeless. How do I get him in? You. I want to let you in. Guest. Guest. Is he guest? Are you recording already? Looks like it. I seem to be. Hello. Who is it? Four one five seven. Do we know you? I'm. Uh, so we'll start at five minutes past. Okay. And Doug, we're recording now. That's a really ugly gopher. <laughs> oh, you don't think he's cute? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Mascot. <laughs> Smiley. <laughs> well, we're here and folks are talking. Does anybody have any specific questions to address today? So when you, you're including gophers, is this mold also? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, but no. So we're gonna identify moles versus gophers and um, talk about why they're different, but we're not gonna talk about mole control. Okay. We can probably hit that in the Q and A. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious about the gophers and kind of non leaf non lethal ways uh, to keep them from eating everything. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I have had rat problems in the garden. Will we be addressing rats at all? You know, that is a class that we offer. We do vertebrate pest management and it's two and a half hours and it's in person and it's pretty comprehensive. And tonight we have one hour, so we are gonna skip the rats this time. It might show okay. up in another, um, another presentation later, but I am gonna um, show you a wonderful website with all kinds of resources for any rodent. Possible. How about bunny rabbits? Oh yeah, bunny rabbits too. We won't be covering bunnies today, <laughs> sorry. But we will cover it in our vertebrate. When, when we do the vertebrate <laughs> management, we'll do it again. It is almost Easter and all. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, 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 they are eating quite a bit. Uh -huh. So everybody that joined, we, we are. We are waiting till 5.05 .05 for as many to join as can join. Do you bother to do anything about aphids? We do an invertebrate pest management class as well, and that's where we talk about aphids. We, in our question and answer period, we can cover some quick answers to some of those things. Exactly. We're covered here. Right. Is the, um, are birds part of the, um, well, you have some birds here, but I mean like crows and stuff, part of the vertebrae one too? Yes, we go into a little bit more detail in our vertebrate pest okay. management. Okay, thanks. Birds. Yeah. But we will cover birds today, so. So you there can you throw in some other questions too. So uh, for the sake of bandwidth, we'd like to ask everybody to turn your video off. Uh, we just would like to avoid um, uh, disruptions in the meeting. Thank you. And for the same reason, we're going to mute everyone. Mm -hmm. 
and allow you to unmute yourself when needed. Muting everyone avoids any background noise. Except I think I muted Doug, not good. <laughs> Figure that out when he tries to talk. There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> oh no. Why don't we get going then? Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Doug Lockwood and I'm gonna be helping with managing the meeting today. Our speakers are Delise Weir and Trank Praxel. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we kick off the meeting. Number one, please do turn off your video to save bandwidth. Um, if you'd like closed captioning, in other words, to see the words appear at the bottom of the screen, even as we talk, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says live transcript. Just click on that. Um, please submit your questions in chat. Um, we'll answer the easy ones on the fly in chat, and then we'll pause at the end of each session to answer some of the more uh, complicated or lengthy questions. Um, if you have technical questions, you can direct them to me and I'll do my best to help you with that through chat. Uh, we are recording the session and we'll send you a link to that recording and to the presentation a few days after the class. So we're planned for an hour of lecture today and 30 minutes of Q&A. So let's kick off uh, and Elise and Trink, please take it away. Okay, and I will start us off. Um, this is Trink. So this uh, first slide, it's brought to you by, we are uh, UC Master Gardeners and we're specifically UC Master Gardeners of Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. So Master Gardeners are a subset of the university cooperative extension department and they provide uh, farm advisors to all of the different kinds of agriculture that we have throughout the state. And back in the 70s, when those advisors kind of became overwhelmed with questions from home gardeners, they formed uh, the UC Master Gardener Organization. And we master gardeners are given some pretty comprehensive training by the university. And in exchange for that, we uh, provide research-based knowledge to home gardeners as volunteers. So there's six counties in California that, um, well, excuse me, all but six counties in California now have a master gardener program. Um, we unfortunately don't get a lot of funding from the University of California, so we do various things to raise our own funds. And so thank you very much to those of you that donated today. Those donations will go to our Monterey Bay Master Gardener nonprofit, which supports the UC program. That's what you see there. So next slide. Um, this is about us, the, your instructors, Trink, that's me, and Elise will be speaking soon. We both became master gardeners, well, you see those years, it was a number of years ago. <laughs> we were lifelong gardeners before then, and now in our home gardens, Delise really tends more towards food and herbs, and while I can't seem to resist doing perennials along with the vegetables and everything else. So, but we both love to garden, we both love to teach, and we especially like teaching together, which makes it fun. So um, integrated pest management is one thing that we have focused on in our teaching and we really enjoy the challenge of that. Next slide there, Delise. Yeah, so what's eating your garden? Uh, we always like to start asking people, you know, what are you seeing in your garden? And we're gonna do it now since this is really our first virtual class. We're trying out some new things and we're gonna give you a little poll here um, through the Zoom process. And Doug, uh, activate that to tell us what um, pests you see, what actually, what signs of pests you see in your garden. Uh, and as you answer that, I don't see the answers coming in, Doug, so you'll just have to let me know. Okay. We're just gonna give it a few minutes. Please go ahead and select the answers that tell us what you see in your garden right now. Okay, I have to launch the poll and I'm doing that now. Okay, great. Okay. It's coming. There you go. Now I see it. So I see some of you are commenting also in chat. 
for anyone who's just joining us, um, please put any questions or comments in the chat. We'll have an answer seg uh, period after each of our segments, and uh, we may try to answer some easy, easy questions in the chat. Curly leaves on a lemon tree. So there are going to be some things that we're not going to cover um, in this class. But if we have time later, we'll address all kinds of questions. And it also gives us hints as to what you'll like to see from us in the future. So how's it going? Is everybody filling out the poll? It looks like it's slowing down. down. OK. Now we've had a number of responses. 56 out of 68, 82% have voted. Okay, great. And what do we see? Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. Okay. And share the results. Great. Okay, lots of mounds of dirt, I see. That's to be expected. Something eating your seedlings. Yep. Something eating some larger vegetables. Uh, and some perennial damage. Some seeds not sprouting. And plant roots, of course. But that's what we expected, and those are kind of the things we're going to focus on here. Um, so why don't we go to that next slide, Delise, and take down the poll. Terrific. Great. So this is, you know, you can see here on the third bullet, we're going to focus on spring pests, specifically gophers, snails, slugs, earwigs as well, and birds. That's what we're going to focus on today. Um, but we're going to start by giving you some basic IPM principles. Um, because understanding integrated pest management really gives you a good framework for addressing any pest, whether it's an insect or a vertebrate or a weed or even a disease. It's, a, it's really an approach that helps you diagnose what's really causing the problem that you're seeing. And then you learn about that pest. And then you identify the best scientifically proven strategy to address that situation. So, um, so what is IPM? Let's go to the next slide, Elise. Uh, and oh, sorry, we're also going to tell you where to get help. Okay, here's what, what is IPM. Let's start with this good definition of IPM and focus on some of the key terms that you see used there. First, it's an ecosystem-based strategy. That is, it, it really looks at a community of interacting organisms. And because um, that's what you have in your garden out there, you have an environment, a community. And those factors affect um, the pest and the ability, that pest's ability to thrive. And what you do in one part of the garden may affect what happens in the other part of the garden. So we look at it as an ecosystem. It's focused on natural control factors. And that's really, um, you know, natural life cycles, the life cycle of the pest, the, the natural enemies of that pest, the natural habitat changes of that pest, and um, the food preferences. All of those things really affect how well you can manage it. We look at a combination of techniques and controls. Um, some of them work better than others, and some of them work better uh, together than they do separately. Um, and again, we're keeping pests under control at a tolerable level. Um, we're not seeking, it's minimally disruptive is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to seek to eradicate that pest because it is part of that ecosystem. It serves a purpose, but we're wanting to keep it in balance. Um, so with some natural controls and controls that really have very little impact on our environment or on us as humans or on the non-targeted organisms that live in our garden as well. So let's look at the steps involved in IPM. Next slide. Great. As you can see here, it's really a continual process. It's not just something you think about a couple of times a year. It, it requires you to regularly monitor what's going on in your garden, inspecting it. This can be done with your morning coffee. I mean, that's when I do it. I take my dog out. First thing when we get up, we get our coffee. I walk around the garden and she takes care of her business. <laughs> um, you can do it while you're hand watering. I, I hope, it, I, in fact, I always like to keep my irrigation at a level where it forces me to do some hand watering because it also forces me to really look closely at my plants. Uh, it means really taking the time to pay attention to what's happening out there in your garden. 
uh, when you see that first chewed leaf or a new hole or, or whatever it is, it's time to start thinking about IPM. Uh, time to think thinking, what is that pest? Uh, and then to ask yourself, how many of them are, are out there? Uh, what damage are they really doing? Uh, how much control, what kind of control can I have here? Um, then correctly identifying that pest and knowing its biology and its habits will help you understand if it's really um, a pest for you and help you choose the most effective and least toxic management strategy for that pest. Um, and then, then as we get to the later levels of that circle, um, you want to address it, then you want to um, notice how effective it is and then notice and then maybe document it for future reference because what worked for you in your garden may be different than what works for somebody else in their garden and you want to remember that and go back to it. So again and then it starts again again it's a cycle. Next slide Delise please. So also consider your tolerance level. Um, we'd like to remind gardeners, and I remind myself of this, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to produce a completely perfect <laughs> and undamaged fruit, vegetable, or ornamental plant. There's just too much happening in that environment out there. There will be some damage no matter what you do. Um, yeah, you're probably even going to bring some slugs and some earwigs into your kitchen sink sometimes. Um, they're just going to be in there. Once you have um, some, once you assume that some damage is inevitable, you can begin to define for yourself how much damage can you live with? Can you control the pest enough so that you can meet your own limits of damage, your own economic limits, your own aesthetic limits? Can you tolerate some chewed uh, lettuce leaves? Or, um, but just realize that the pest populations in your garden can take a large jump. Uh, it, really quickly if it, they're not monitored and controlled. So you can go from a chewed leaf to practically no lettuce if you don't do that regular monitoring and do the, the, um, the steps of making some control to control that population. So, so the, there, I mentioned earlier that there are certain kinds of IPM controls uh, and these are kind of um, different categorizations of controls that are used in IPM typically, and there's these four categories. Um, knowing about these categories helps you kind of think through the possible steps that you could take. So for example, cultural controls means things in which you change your gardening practices. You do things differently. You grow plants, maybe that that pest doesn't eat. Uh, you remove some hiding places. You provide some alternative sources of food. Physical ones are where you create some kind of a, a, a physical change um, that has an impact on the plant. Uh, you exclude it, you trap it, excuse me, on the pest. You exclude it, you trap it, you frighten it. Um, biological are the ones where we use those natural enemies. Um, there are sometimes more natural enemies when we're talking about invertebrates, but they, this is true also for the ones we're gonna be talking about today. And then the final is the chemical, which we, of course, want to always use the least impactful uh, technique. So chemicals are really always our last resort and only when they're really necessary. We will we'll talk about some of the examples that we've given under each of these different kinds of controls as we go through our presentation today. And you'll see it in our slides. We'll identify it as a physical control or a cultural control. So you begin to get that concept down a little bit. Okay, uh, next slide there. And I think we're ready to hand it off to Delise. Ah, for some questions about IPM. Any that anyone wants to ask or any that you've seen here, Doug? We're seeing a lot of comments about the ding ding. So the doorbell is apparently heard everywhere. We <laughs> thought we'd tested for that. And I'm very sorry, I can't find the control that turns it off. So hopefully latecomers will slow down and it's get us out for next time. People leaving the meeting too, Delise. So yeah, we'll have to look in the, the settings. Yeah. To do about leaving that. the meeting, no way. <laughs> <clears throat> it happens, yeah. Okay. Natural controls becoming problems by themselves. Um, 
at, for example, introducing birds as natural controls. <laughs> uh, that is true it, that, you know, birds that come into your garden are natural controls. And yes, they can sometimes impact things that you don't intend them to. Um, so it, as we said, it's kind of a, ban, a, uh, a balance out there. Um, I like your question about companion planting. Uh, and you know, it's, let's save that for later. Um, so let's just turn this over to Delise now and we can jump into that first section, Delise. Okay. Because we know a lot of you are here for this. <laughs> All righty. So as you know, and as some of you have even asked, there are a lot of ground dwelling rodents and creatures, mammals of all kinds that will invade your garden. But today we're gonna to focus on gophers and uh, they are breeding at this time of year and you wanna get ahead of that population. But in order to learn how to differentiate between gophers and moles who do um, kind of similar uh, mounding problems, I wanted to speak to that a little bit too. Gophers and moles are very different. So team gopher. The crescent shaped mound, the, um, the run comes up at a lateral kind of an angle and they push the soil out and that makes a fan shape or crescent shaped um, pile of dirt. And then they usually push a bunch of dirt out and then they'll cap the, the hole um, with a little plug of dirt. Gophers eat plants, moles do not eat plants. They also, the moles, come straight up out of the ground and they do a volcano shaped mound. So the shape of the mound is your, um, your key indicator. You know that the same control mechanism isn't gonna work because they eat completely different things. Both of them mostly stay underground and moles have that um, you know, very characteristic feeding runway. Those just under the surface kind of tunnels that happen and really mess up your lawn. Another important thing to know about moles is that they have a very large territory that they guard. It can be up to two miles, square miles, and that's, um, that's huge. So they're very few and far between. So here's your gopher pushing his crescent shaped mound. That's what you're gonna see. And you usually see a couple of them in a, in a cluster. It, which is a good thing because that's how you go in and find their main run. The um, other indicator is going to be missing or totally wilted in dead plants with the roots gone. It's not the time of year for full grown plants to, to be, you know, out there unless it's a perennial or some kind of um, larger established plant. But if it's little, little vegetable garden plants, the moles aren't, or the gophers aren't your big problem yet, but they're going to be. So get on them now. Here's your gopher coming out of his volcano shaped mound. And here is the feeding, uh, feeding runway that disturbs the grass. Um, they like a moist, a moist situation that brings out the grubs and the worms. So you'll often see moles active in lawns after um, a watering or a rain but they don't eat plants, they eat grubs. So I'm gonna, pa I'm gonna move on. And they really, the only realistic way to uh, deal with them is with special mole traps. We're not gonna get into that today, but it's, it's very similar to the gopher traps. So know your enemy. What is going on with these gophers? Um, this is the key and most important thing of implementing an IPM strategy is you have to know what you're looking at, who's doing the damage, and then what is their lifestyle? What are their natural history characteristics? So you can use that information to do an effective intervention. Um, gophers as moles are solitary, they're territorial. They're especially active this time of year because the soil is soft. They're breeding, so even though they're territorial, they do manage to um, find a mate and they do manage to share space with their offspring, which they can have uh, three to four pups every year. So you could have, you know, up to five gophers in your 
700 square yards of territory that they take over um, pretty easily. It's important to know that if you do manage to kill a gopher, it's a very good chance that another gopher will come and inhabit their run. But your work is never done. Here is a link. You can see this yellow bar at the bottom. This is um, a pest note on the IPM website for UC ANR. This is an incredibly great resource. Uh, you'll have access to these slides after the class and you can click on that link and go there and just see reams of information about um, gophers, how they live and how you can get rid of them. So let's talk a little bit about low impact, meaning not deadly poison ways of dealing with them. Um, Trank told us about cultural methods. So is it possible to grow plants that gophers don't like? Well, there are very few plants that gophers don't like. Uh, they do find daffodils are poisonous. And I once grew a bed with daffodils all around the edge, trying to keep them out as seeing if it would work as a barrier. They very handily just went under, no problem there. <laughs> a couple of them, they knocked out of the way. So they'll do that. The best, um, the best cure is prevention in an IPM strategy. And so for gophers, that's going to be underwiring beds. That's going to be planting in baskets, uh, putting an underground fence that is a barrier for them to not get through. These are all really effective strategies and really labor intensive and capital intensive. So if you happen to be digging up your beds and uh, putting them anew, then you will want to make sure you underwire. You'll want to underwire with the ideal um, material to use is half inch hardware cloth that is coated with plastic. That will last you for years and years. Other wire um, is prone to rotting or you know rusting and rotting and then the gophers get in after, oh, I don't know, maybe five years. Um, the other way to go is with traps, and we're going to look at traps in some detail in just a minute. Um, the, the nature's way is biological control, and you should know for sure that if you're, you know, poisoning gophers, that there are birds of prey that are going to find them and eat them. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, if you have a really excellent cat that will eat your gophers, you can... Um, probably get away without trapping or, or wiring, but it's, it's very rare that you can find a natural uh, biological control that's um, going to save your backyard garden. It's just, there's just not enough high level predators per square foot to do the trick. So when you are getting ready to trap, the, the main thing you want to find out is where the heck are they? And they're underground. You can't see them. So Finding the run is very important. And the way I do that, there's a lateral run with the crescent shaped mound. Maybe there's a couple of them. And um, somewhere in between, when you see some you know, little piles of dirt and they have to be fresh, you take something long and pointy. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is a straight weeder. That works pretty well. And you just poke until you start, you know, find a place where you're not getting resistance. I also have this great tool. This is from another gopher, um, a gopher trap called a gopher hawk. And it's one of, it's a part of the tool that's used for the probe. And it's a long, skinny, pointy stick. And this is the best part of that trap set that I have, because I don't use the trap part, I just use the probe. You're gonna to wanna to find the main run. Now you may not find the main run like it says in this picture down here, cause that's a little bit low in the ground, but you'll definitely find this lateral run, this side run. Um, and that's a good place to set your traps. Ideally you stake in and you set the traps going in both directions. So if you find the main run and you can clear it out, you have one coming and going and you're gonna get um, whoever comes through. And you will um, definitely, want to flag where you plant it, where you put the traps, because they will um, be hard to find later on. I find that if I check every 12 hours, 
it's usually in the morning and in the evening that the trapping happens. So let's look at the traps that you're, you know, that are available to you. The most famous one is the old Maccabee trap that was invented by a guy in San Jose in 1800. And that has been, I'm sorry, 1900 by Zephyr Albert Maccabee. And it's um, not my favorite trap because I, I know I could do serious damage with those sharp pokey things. So I do not feel confident handling that and even with gloves on and it's not what I would do. Um, I do um, also have a dog and this would be dangerous for a little curious dog schnout. I used to use these quite a bit. They are box traps. The one on the right, the black one is called a black hole. And with this, you have to really dig to get two of them going two directions. And that takes, you know, that's like coming up with a whole lot of soil that may be the, in the middle of your vegetable garden. So um, they're effective, they're good. I like the wooden one um, with a larger opening rather than the black hole type, but um, they're effective. I sometimes use a post hole digger to dig the hole, to kind of get down there and um, find the run. And that's a really quick way to uh, dig and see if I've successfully found the run and then reach down, excavate a little bit and set the trap. Here's the one I was just showing you the probe for. There's this probe and then there's this uh, little cage at the bottom. You, you set this thing upright in a very narrow hole. It's very effective. Any, any direction the gopher is running, you, it will trigger it and it will um, just die instantly with a, with a serious smack up. It pulls up in this little cage but I find the cage is delicate and I have managed to, ki to kill two of the traps. I've broken two of the traps. Um, the cage seems to break for me and um, they're about $30 each. So I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> and that's the gopher hawk, just to be clear. It's called the gopher hawk, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is another very old design, but it's very effective. And this is Trink's favorite. My favorite. And it's called a cinch trap. And we will look at a video of how to set a cinch trap. I have to note that all of these require some physical strength with your hands. If you have any um, arthritis, it can be very difficult to set one of these traps. Oh, what happened there? That was not what I wanted to have happen. <laughs> Hold that thought. We'll go back to that. I'm going back. There you are. So this is called the gofinator, this little trap on the right. And this is my favorite. And we're going to watch a video of it too. It goes down into the run. The um, cinch trap sort of sits halfway in, halfway out. But let's go look at that before. And before we actually start the video, I'm going to do some optimization. Oh, darn. Now I have stopped sharing. So sorry, everybody. This we, we fixes them in. Technical difficulties. All right, there's my little buddy. Now I am optimizing for video and I'm sharing sound. Okay. So I'm gonna um, start this at a certain point and then we're gonna stop it early. And you tell me if this- Well, it's been a while since we- Notice in this video, he is And it's still one of the best gopher traps. What's that, Trink? I'm just telling everyone, notice he's not wearing gloves, which is not recommended. You should always have gloves on when you're doing this. Incredibly good point, thank you. Available on the market today. It consists of two jaws you place down in the gopher tunnel, a trigger, some levers to set it, and a powerful spring. We'll pull those levers up and lift that spring. And as we do, you can see how those jaws open. As the gopher puts its body through there, it'll slam shut. To set it, we open the jaws. You can see that powerful spring winding up and we hold it down with the first lever. You know, the physics of this make it pretty easy to hold down, but we place the second lever on that. That way it's a very light touch to set off the trap. 
Then we pull this forward right here. And that holds down the spring. It's ready to go. With the jaws in the tunnel, the gopher will come along, place its body in there, hit that trigger, and when it does, we got it. That is extremely powerful. So here's the exact kind of gopher. Okay, so I'm curious, could, if you could tell me in your chat, did that video render well? Did it stutter? Did it buffer? It buffered once in my experience, but otherwise, yeah. Lagged a bit, buffered a bit. Okay, we got some stuttering and buffering. Okay, apologize for that. I want you to know that you're going to have access to this so you can watch it. And I have to say that no one viewing of any video to set one of these traps is going to teach you how to set the trap. I had to watch the Gofinator one over and over and over to finally get, get it. But as Trink said, wear your heavy gloves. My kid skin gloves are my favorite. Not just to protect your uh, hands, but also to keep your human scent off of the trap. I so think. they say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look. Well, it's been a while since we've caught gophers in the day. I'm done with you. I'm done with you. <laughs> do this one. Okay, now we're going to do the gophinator. You see when I stop and start here. Um, I realize that it, it stutters and, um, and jerks, but we tried doing this in front, you know, live action in front of my camera here, and it was hilarious. So I don't want to subject you to that. <laughs> Come on, little fella. The different components of the trap are a winder, which is a spring with a hook here. There's a pan or a trigger. There's a little loop on this side for the trigger system. There's a trip bar here, has a little hook on this end, and then two jaws. One's fixed and one rotates. The left side moves up and down. Now to set it, you wanna make sure this is unwound you want to position the trip bar here so the hook goes over the jaw and then you hook it on the pan. You push that forward. Now what you want to do is hook this winder up here on the hook. The first wind is not powerful enough. We'll go around again. That has quite a bit of tension. Keep this pan forward. That's what's keeping the trap set right here. Then when it's set like this, you put it underground. The gopher will come through his tunnel. His body will be in between these jaws. Push the pan forward, release the lever, and the spring will wind around and cause the jaws to close just like this. That has quite a bit of force and the gopher will die very quickly with a body catch like that. Now go. So the good news is that they do kill very quickly. Yes. <clears throat> the bad news is sometimes they aren't completely dead and they tend to drag themselves down the run with the um, trap in tow. So you always want to make sure that the trap is staked with a string. You want to you want to anchor it to something so it does not walk away and you never see it again. Because these are pricey as well. I would just add, and Felice and I would like to uh, compliment each other <laughs> in various ways. But it's why I love my um, the 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 larger one with. What's the name of it? I've forgotten. The cinch trap it, best because you don't really have to get it all the way down into the hole in order to uh, have it be effective. And uh, I think I have found you can easily see whether it has been set or not. Uh, and I have found that maybe only once out of five or six times does a gopher not get killed by it. Um, if I've caught him, he's pretty much dead. And it's a matter of kind of then letting, releasing it. Uh, and I think Delise will talk about this, the dead, what to do with the dead gopher. You might want to talk about that. That's right. So where do you hide the body? Good question. Yep. You just stuff it back in the hole. That's the best place to put it, where it's going to feed your plants and deter other gophers. As you, as I, the, my answer to that would be because I'm often catching gophers in um, a perennial bed rather than Delise is catching hers in her larger vegetable beds, um, then I don't want that dead body in my perennial bed because I may come across it 
in doing some digging. So I put it in a plastic bag and put it in the garbage. But both approaches are fine. It's just what works best for you. And in a backyard garden, you don't necessarily want to leave it out where cats can find it because yeah. it might have eaten some anticoagulant bait at some point in its life. And you just want to protect that. So garbage, meaning landfill garbage, not recycling, not, not green waste. Right. Um, it's not recommended. Yeah. OK. Some people absolutely positively cannot deal with the dead gophers directly. Those of you who are like that, um, or maybe you're, you're not around your garden long, often enough to monitor the populations, which could be a you know once a week community garden kind of person. So if you plan to use bait, there's um, one class of bait that's available to you as a retail customer, and it contains anticoagulants such as warfarin, the kind your grandma uses for her heart condition. And it requires multiple feedings to kill the gopher. They, they then um, feel peaked and go down to their deep depths of their burrow and, and die. Now, the, the worst thing that could happen there is the dog could dig it up. This kind of multiple dose co anticoagulant will, will not probably not kill a large mammal if they eat the gopher. There just isn't enough um, to do that, could it, but it could make them sick and make them go to the hospital. Um, there are other kinds that are much stronger. They are single dose, they're anticoagulant, and they're straight up strychnine poisons. And those are usually used in an agricultural setting. But sometimes you will hire someone to deal with your gophers, and they will have the kind of license that they can use this bait. And that's what you really, really don't want to use. So you want to tell your professionals not to use those because that will concentrate in the higher level um, uh, predator um, tissue and, and go up the food chain. So it's very bad for birds of prey, mountain lions, um, kitty cats and dogs could die of eating one of these gophers. Um, it's just not appropriate for a home setting. So don't let it happen to you. Here is a great fact sheet on rodent side that will give you all that information. Um, there are a lot of other things you've probably heard of, putting your car exhaust down the hole, explosives, shooting guns at it, not recommended in your backyard. Uh, chewing gum, laxatives, vibrators, noise producers, repellents of all kinds, they just don't work very well. There are gassers um, that there's actually a carbon monoxide service that agricultural um, applications use, but you, you really have to cover up all the exit holes for all the smoke, basically all the, all the gas, and that's very hard to do. And gophers very easily just build a wall and um, exclude it. So th that's, that's like, that's a maybe, but not exactly. The one and only kind of bait that I would consider using is in a wax impregnated block. It's grain in a wax candy bar looking thing that you would put in the hole. It has the multiple feeding type anticoagulant bait. They drag it down into the very deep depths, could be down as, as far as six feet down into their feeding or their little food storage place. And they eat it you know, repeatedly and tend to die underground and then because it's wax impregnated, the next gopher that comes along can take advantage of it as well. So um, I don't use bait of any kind, but if I did, it would be this kind. At least in the chat, someone asked about a urine based or urine smelled product. I think I would put that in the not recommended or not effective category. I would say you can pay for it and throw your money away, yeah. Yeah, so this would be like mountain lion and coyote um, scares me bait. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening as a, as a good Someone thing. else asked the question, what kind of trap would work best in sandy soil where the tunnels collapse easily? You know, that is a very good question. Um, probably your cinch trap because 
and as Trank was mentioning, it kind of lays halfway up, halfway down. And the way um, there's other videos at the end of the slide deck that you know you can see when you receive the slide deck, but it if you see one of those crescent shaped mounds, you just dig um, with your hori hori knife down the tunnel, kind of the way the gopher came up is the way you're going to go in, and you kind of clear that out and put your cinch trap down in there, um, and bam. My only problem with a cinch trap is my dog who likes to stick his nose in holes. Right. And I just got a dog that does that, so I may have to change. But, you know, you can always put a um, something over it. Uh, I put a, you know, just a big bucket or something over it and something heavy on top, so uh, it won't. But he could. That is an issue. Um, there's a question about using a road flare in the tunnel. I think yeah, I've heard of that. That's, a, that's another method of gassing. Um, like I said, they can quickly, you know, block off the tunnel and, and wander away without it being an issue. And the professional way that they do the carbon monoxide, um, which is they get a little carbon monoxide generator out into the field. They start by putting a colored smoke into the tunnels. And then they see where the smoke's coming out and they go and they cover all the, all the exits. And then they use the carbon monoxide to exclude the air from the tunnels and it seems to work, but it's kind of pricey and it's a lot of big equipment. Not for home users really. Yeah. And someone says, I live on a golf course. I have a ton of gophers. Um, it's not feasible to put traps everywhere. I would argue that there's probably um, really only two or three gophers uh, within that area. Uh, and it could be greater. It really could be greater. But to watch some videos online. There's some, I remember one where, um, you know, a professional group went out and they used um, uh, the gophinator, not the gophinator, I think they used the Maccabee. But essentially in one day they killed something like 10 gophers. So it's not unusual to be able to kill a large number of gophers. Uh, it's just your method of trapping, of being able to find the, whole, the run and set the traps. And you really could kill that many gophers in one day. It, it is done frequently by the professionals. And I would just encourage, I mean, if I can learn, I always say this, if I can learn to set a trap and kill a gopher, almost anybody can. Um, so it, it's not that hard. And I know it sounds awful, but if you're really protecting an investment in your garden, you get pretty highly motivated and uh, it becomes kind of a fun challenge. Um, and you might not get it right away, but if you keep trying, um, you will. You, you know, it, anybody can learn it. I encourage encourage you to try it. Someone says they've used po dog poop down a hole. All of these kinds of things, they might work once. Um, and then it may be that the gopher, in fact, just moved on to another area, or it was later in the spring and they became less active. There could be a lot of reasons why something worked once uh, and might not work again. Um, yeah, in my experience, the repellents are not that effective. You can try it. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, I have to commiserate with the fellow who's on the golf course. I too have a big open field next to my house and they just seem to stand in line and wait for the gopher <laughs> run to be ready to re-inhabit. Um, it's a lady that lives near the golf course. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. There are, some, there are some good gopher catchers in our county as well. Um, I won't give you any names because we can't recommend, but I can say that if this is something you're having real problems with, now is the time to bring springtime, this, this time right now when they're so active. If you really want professional help, there are some good people out there who can do it for you. And, and some I, are like bounty hunters, they charge by the gopher. They do. <laughs> And I find that if I kill one or two during this period of time, then things are pretty quiet again until maybe the fall. And I, I might have to have one other trapping session in the fall. Somebody wants to know what a hori hori is. It's this, it's this fierce looking knife. Um, it's a tool, it's a garden tool. So you can find them in any garden center. It's a Japanese garden tool, obviously. 
because it's mm -hmm. called a hori hori. Elise, would you go back to your wonderful uh, gopher team, team gopher? Uh, well, that's going to be challenging. Hold on. Is it? Because I was just trying to show where exactly the hole is most likely to be. Um, and that, I think, diagram, you can show it very effectively. There, there it is. So right where that gopher is sitting uh, in the team gopher, it, you can see that it's on the other side of the mound is where that run is coming up. So when you see that mound, that crescent shaped mound, you want to go to the other side of the hole and put your hori hori in there. That's where you're going to find that run. True that. Okay, let's move on. We can come back to these things, but let's move on to other spring pests. Okay. So as we all know, cool wet weather will bring us snails, slugs, and earwigs. So looking at this slide, we have feeding damage from three different creatures that have absolutely different methods of control <clears throat> that operate differently. Um, and if you apply the solution to one, you will not solve the problem if it is another. So the earwig has this feeding damage with lots of lacy little holes. The slug has feeding damage where the rasping tongue has chewed it from the outside in. And cabbage butterflies, eggs were laid under the leaf and they create these little windows of skin on the top. So there's some indicators you can get from the feeding damage, but it's not definitive. So you have to know more. Know your enemy is your IPM watchword. So <laughs> you want to look around in the daytime, look at all the plant parts, look at the stem, look at under the leaf, over the leaf. You want to look for things like, um, well, you want to examine the feeding damage. You want to determine whether it's been somehow sucked on. That would be um, a wilting kind of behavior versus chewed or rasped. Is there any frass, also known as poop? Are you seeing shiny, sparkly little slime trails? My mother used to call them fairy footprints. And then to really uh, you know, catch them in the act, it's good to go out at night with a flashlight. And again, look under and over, about 10 o'clock at night is a good time to stalk them. And you will likely find slug snails and earwigs doing their worst. And then you will know exactly what your problem is, how to deal with it. With all of these creatures, once you've knocked down the population, you're in pretty good shape. So I find that if I go out and hand pick at night mm -hmm. um, for seven days in a row, I can really solve my problem for the season. And the way you do it is you go out, you maybe put gloves on if you think it's too yucky. Um, you drop, so, drop you, you pick them off. That's easy with snails because they're easy to get your hands on. You might want to use tweezers if it's um, slugs and um, drop them into soapy or salty water, wait for them to die, and then compost them. You can also put them in a bag and throw them in the garbage. Or ideally, you would feed them to your chickens and your ducks. And if you do this every night for a week, you should be in pretty good shape. Now I have actually made escargot out of my snails. I tried that once. It wasn't that delicious, I have to admit, but you could do that too. And one thing I should tell you all about snails, they are, they are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female parts. So any snail that runs into any other snail will, will get it coming and going and will walk away. They will each go off and lay eggs. So. They're a very prolific, successful, inv invasive creature. Cultural management is key to um, preventing the problem. So they're looking for hiding places, ivy, weedy areas, piles of boards and debris, um, uh, inverted pots, things that are lying around. I am infamous for having a dirty garden. <laughs> so this, um, is also a great way to look for them. If you are cleaning up, you will find lots of them. 
you want to put your garden in the sunniest spot possible for sunny, sun loving plants anyway, um, because then the soil will dry out, it will be less attractive for them. And um, you can reduce the moist surfaces on the soil with a drip irrigation system or by watering in the morning where again it dries out and they don't just burrow into the soil and love it in there and not go away. Trapping is an effective thing to do with snails when you have a great idea like this. It's a board that's about an inch off the, uh, the ground with runners. It's a perfect place for the snails to go under. During the day, you just flip it over, collect them, do them in. You can even step on them if you want. Um, and then do that every day for a little while. You should have a great, great impact. There's no one in the world who doesn't think that beer traps are good for catching snails. And um, I guess if you do it right, it can work pretty well. People always say so. It has never worked properly for me, but I think it's because I dilute them by watering my plants and they get wet. So you, you fill a, a buried, you, you basically have to sink the container to soil level and they will go in and not come out and you fill it with beer or yeast and water or sugar and water and they should have deep vertical sides so they can't easily get out and um, repeat them every couple of feet and then to prevent the rain or your watering can from diluting them this little uh, little pie pan hat is pretty useful. There's only one barrier method that I know. I know that snails can like walk over a razor blade. So there's, there's no physical barrier that will, you know, be too rough for them to go over. But copper does a chemical interaction with their, um, their, uh, their foot, which is what they travel on. Um, it's sort of like an electric shock to them. So there's copper uh, copper bands that you can buy, um, copper tape that you can either put in the soil or attach to the bed or the, or the pot. Um, and you want to make sure that you're, you're covering the entire um, uh, area around what you want to protect. If there's any overhanging plants that are creating a bridge between uh, the outside and the inside, that's not good. The copper products are a little bit pricey and they, um, they tarnish or they get dusty after a few weeks or months. So um, you can clean them with vinegar and that gets them all activated again. And the thing to remember with these is it only excludes them, it does not kill them. So here are some examples of it in action. This is a a raised bed with a copper border kind of looks pretty. Here's like a little fence of some knitted copper stuff, um, a ring and around a pot. They tried the sharp thing too. And then I saw someone in England had put pennies around the edge of their beds. I thought that was a, a fun idea. Elisa, one thing to remember on using copper is that you are trapping in any slugs that are in there. So make sure that uh, you eradicate all the slugs within that area before, or snails, before you put in the copper, use the copper. And slugs like to burrow into the soil when they're during the daytime. So yeah, if they're in, they're in. They can't get out. <laughs> all right, once again, if we're feeling like we absolutely positively have to use a bait, there is one, there is one that you can use that is organically certified, OMRI approved, um, and that is iron phosphate. It's safe for dogs, for children, for wildlife. And uh, there's, um, it's the brand name Sluggo, it's familiar to us. We see it in the stores all the time. And the plus is Spinosad. So it's pretty expensive. This little can of Sluggo Spinosad is pretty pricey but um, it will control slug snails and earwigs all at once. You wanna um, avoid metaldehyde baits. Those are desiccants and um, you'll see snail shells all lying around um, after you use that. 
but it's not good for dogs or for birds. And when you use any of these baits, you want to irrigate first, then apply them. In the evening is a good time. You scatter it, don't pile it up, and then don't water afterwards for a while because that's going to dilute it. A question, a question, um, a good question here in the chat about uh, eggs, the eggs of the snails and slugs. If you check every night, how long does it take for those eggs to hatch? You know the answer to that one, Delise? So they tend to lay their eggs in the soil. And sometimes when you're digging around, you will find them. They're beautiful little pearls um, that you want to get rid of. And then when they hatch, they're like fully formed, teeny tiny little, little snails. Um, and you want to get rid of them if you see them because they are as voracious as their parents. Um, you can't really find or control them unless you accidentally come across them. Is that the question? How long it takes to it, for those to hatch and I'm not, um, Oh, how long to hatch? That's, yeah. that's a um, research project. I don't know. <laughs> we should know that one. So we'll figure that's that out. That's a good question. We'll see if we can find out. Absolutely. Someone says that they see the birds eating the sluggo. Um, it supposedly won't hurt them, but I sometimes wonder if what the birds are eating are other things in the soil and not the sluggo. Uh, and the possibility of buying iron sulfate granules in bulk. No idea. Where yeah. would you do that? <laughs> if, uh, if that were true, it would seem to be effective because that's essentially uh, what the sluggo is. So, yep. Okay, let's cover these earwigs quick. So, again, you want to remove the habitat, nice, tidy, warm dry little places, or moist actually. I think not too hot, that's what I know. They don't, they don't like to heat up, so they find a shady cool place to go. So you wanna clean up your yard. Um, this trapping method has worked for me really well. A rolled up newspaper that's rolled up really tight, or a little length of bamboo that's closed at one end, maybe about a foot. Cardboard tubes with corrugated cardboard, they like those little little uh, areas to crawl into. You lay them around the plants at night and then in the morning with your coffee, required coffee, shake them out onto something hard and they'll scatter and you'll stomp them real quick. Do that seven nights in a row and you've got it handled. There's also a vegetable oil, oil kind of like the, the beer trap. It's, um, it's a little tuna can, it's sunk into the ground got half, a, half an inch of oil and then um, maybe a little molasses or fish oil or bacon grease and then fill um, with some water and bury it to the rim. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. So here's a trap that's trapped many, many earwigs in the lower right. This one is a bundle of reeds that makes a good, a good trap, kind of like the bamboo. And here's your cardboard and newspaper versions. And now I'm going to hand it off to Trink, who's going to tell us about birds. Okay, great. Why don't we go to that first slide then? Um, so the first issue is identifying if the damage you are seeing is bird damage. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, you first might see nothing. And that is, you know you planted a row of lettuce, but some, nothing's coming up. Uh, it could be other answers to that question, such as your seeds are too old or they're not viable. But it also could be that the birds have been digging around in your soil and have come across those seeds and gobbled them up, or they started to uh, sprout at the seeds and the, the birds are eating um, the, those fresh new sprouts right away. Um, but your seeds may have come up nicely and then disappeared. Um, or you now see, <coughs> excuse me, ragged torn shapes out of the leaves like you can see in this picture here. Um, it's often from the edge in. I mean, it's always from the edge in. And sometimes it's even pointy peaked shapes, just like a bill would make. 
and you can see that in a couple places in this picture. Uh, it, that, and finally, it could just be entire sections or halves of the leaves, as you can see here, missing, where they're eating all the way up to the midrib of the leaf and leaving only that midrib rib left. Um, so you'll see those kind of damage mostly on young seedlings because they're the most tender things in the garden right now. And as plants grow and get bigger, then they're less tasty for the birds. They're a little more chewable, not e as easy to nibble on. Um, and the birds will do less damage on them. But, and they're mostly, the birds are mostly attracted to these little seedlings in the spring when the birds are more hungry and they're nesting and um, all this new uh, sprouting is coming up. So let's go to the next slide there, Delise. The um, simplest physical control for birds is just keeping them out, excluding them, as we say, uh, from those seedlings. It's simple in that it uses, needs essentially two things, a frame of some sort and some netting. But the specifics of it um, require a little pre-planning because it's best to have it all ready uh, to go when your seeds, before you put your seeds in, your seedlings come up. And it also is, has to be creative in terms of adapting appropriately that frame and that netting to your particular environment and, and what you're trying to grow and in what areas. Um, do you wanna cover just a few plants? Do you wanna cover a whole bed? If it's just a couple plants that you wanna cover, you could probably buy some wire plant closures um, and, or you could use old colanders. I've done this before. I have a couple of old colanders I keep in my gardening supply and I just put that colander right over it. Um, if you want to cover more than that, though, then you need some kind of a frame. It could be anything from wood, as you see in this picture, to PVC, to bamboo, to metal. So just be creative and go online and look. There's actually some really fun, creative approaches to this online. Next slide. Here's a couple of examples. On the left are some bamboo teepee frames, and those are covered by netting. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture, um, but they are. And then the one on the right is actually one of my own vegetable beds. And this is a system that I came up with. I must have seen it somewhere. <laughs> Not that creative. But I've taken a larger PVC and attached it with clamps, just a, probably about a foot high or less, and attached it to the, uh, my raised bed, pieces of wood. And then I have bent smaller PVC inserted into that uh, larger PVC, bent it over the bed and uh, inserted into similar devices on the other side. I then cover it all with netting and I use clamps, essentially PVC clamps that look like this to, um, and which can be tightened by squeezing so that I can then attach the netting all the way around um, that PVC frame. And, and then I take um, wire, like a, uh, what are they called? Irrigation holders, pipe holders. And I use that all the way around to secure that netting because it's, um, they can get inside. Uh, so you wanna anchor it. And you might also wanna put some colored string or something shiny on, uh, on that PVC frame or on that bamboo, just to kind of let the birds know that that netting is there because the worst that can happen, it hasn't happened to me, but they, birds can sometimes get stuck in that netting. Can I, can I burst in? There's a, um, there's a comment, somebody's using row cover or floating row um, to cover their, their beds and, and they're covering peas. And so that made me think because the row cover can have a greenhouse effect underneath it can make it warm. Um, so if that's what you want to do, that's a good thing. Um, bird netting can actually get birds stuck in it. It can be kind of a mess. Yeah. So another option you might want to think about using is tool, the kind that wedding veils are made out of. And you can buy a bolt of it and it works really good. It's super light. It excludes little insects that are flying um, and birds. And you don't even have to have a framework for it. I just lay it on the plants. 
<laughs> That's great. I also use my PVC frames for uh, cloth when it comes, when the um, butterflies come around and uh, then it's time to switch out the netting to the cloth. So you could in fact only just do the cloth if you wanted. As Dilly says, that tool is a good approach. So essentially a frame. The other approach with birds is scaring them away. Again, a physical control. Um, something shiny will, uh, it needs to be something shining and it needs to be something that is moving. So uh, in order to scare them away. But people have used old CDs, mirrors, uh, shiny tape like you see here. Some people use noisemakers of various kinds. There's screech owl machines that you could use. Um, but the issue here is that the birds get used to almost anything. So you, it's best to use them only when it's most needed and then to change it up on a regular basis. Uh, okay. And here are a couple of, of examples of that, those kind of shiny things. Um, the CDs and then on the left is a way of taking just a plastic bottle and cutting it up and then letting the wind blow it. So again, creative ways. So that's pretty much our brief presentation, but we'll answer a bunch of questions next. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to just show a couple of com things coming up. One is we, Delisa and I really like to always fine tune our approach. And anytime someone asks us a question that we can't answer, we definitely research and add it in. But we have an, a small short evaluation survey that um, is going to, I think Doug is gonna put in the chat right here. And we ask you just to please take a couple of minutes. That's all it will do to give us some feedback. And then you're also going to get an evaluation from the UC Master Gardener office in Davis probably a couple months from now. Uh, they like to send out a survey to find out if you're actually using the information you've learned from our Master Gardener classes. Uh, as you can imagine, that's very helpful to be able to show what kind of an impact we're having on gardening uh, in California. And that can also help us raise funds. So please look for that and respond to that. We're working on topics that we're going to try to do more of these virtual classes. Uh, here's a list of some that we're considering right now. Gardening with natives, vegetable gardening, dahlias, laundry to landscape. But we'd love to hear from you of ideas that um, you would like to see in a, in a virtual class before we can all get together again. So Elise, you want to go next? To the... Sure, I'm answering questions. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a little information about a plant sale. We are, the Master Gardeners of Monterey and Santa Cruz are having a plant sale uh, April 19 to May 2nd. Uh, you can order and pay online and those are being grown by our own Master Gardeners out in Salinas. And uh, you can either go pick them up or I think they're arranging some ways to get uh, plants over here to Santa Cruz to be, to, to be picked up in Santa Cruz as well. So uh, hope look at that. Okay, let's- Somebody wants to know where they can order their plants. Oh, where, uh, go, I think just to our website, our UC Master Gardeners of Monterey and Santa Cruz. Which is mbmg.org, we'll get you there. mbmg.org. Monterey Bay Master Gardeners, mbmg. Right. Um, okay, let's look at some other questions. Um, all righty so we had a question about neem neem oil um and that's a broad spectrum organic pesticide that's mostly for insect pests and di but but not for earwigs they the earwigs will be here after the nuclear holocaust they are very <laughs> tough it's hard to kill them so um it did not apply to anything we were talking about today Somebody wants to know about aphids. Want to do your aphid talk, quick like? <laughs> well, I, I think the thing about you know aphids um, is to remember again, you're not going to get rid of them. You're going to only control them. And someone mentioned soapy water. Yes, um, you know soapy water only works on those insects where that soapy water will impact um, their, their body as such, it'll impact their ability to breathe or fly. And so you, again, you kind of need to know what insect you're dealing with. Um, aphids, yes, can be controlled by soapy water. They can also be controlled, or I should say, reduced in number 
just by plain water, a water spray from your hose um, on the part of the plant that has uh, the aphids and doing that uh, again every other day for a week or so will greatly diminish your population. Um, but remember too that aphids are an insect that is a food source for many beneficial insects. So having some aphids in your garden is not a bad thing. It's going to attract some beneficials. On the With other that. hand, they are born pregnant. They are yes. early born pregnant. <laughs> They are all female and they uh, they go from one to 60 in a, a heartbeat. Yeah. Someone's asked about uh, roly polies or pill bugs. Uh, Delise, you want to give your quick answer I'll, on that? I'll do my thing. Okay. Roly polies get a bad rap. It's not them. They're not the, they're not the culprit because they eat detritus. You'll see lots and lots of them in your compost or around it. They like decomposing material. They don't like your juicy nice green material. So often it happens when a slug has come and eaten a bite out of your strawberry and you've got a little hole and you'll, see, and you'll go out in the morning and you'll see the roly poly inside the hole sort of chewing on the rotting part of the, of the strawberry, um, but it didn't make the hole. So no need to get rid of them, they're, they're friends. Okay. Did you see some others, Doug, that we may have missed? Yeah. Um, there was one question here about whether companion planting is scientifically proven as an IPM method. Right. Define that. that. So I would define that. So you can call companion planting a way of planting tall and short plants in a mixed planting, and that can be companion planting. And then there is the more esoteric um, I, marigolds inhibit nematodes. There is some scientific basis on that. There's a root exudate with marigolds and nematodes, but it's not a cure-all. And then roses love garlic. I think that's a book. Um, the question is, do, are there plants that just have an affinity for each other or somehow like each other and are mutually beneficial? not so well understood by science. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And even in the example of marigolds and soil nematodes, you know, the, the effective radius of something like that is likely quite small. So, you know, even if there was a scientifically proven repellent, um, would it actually work at scale in uh, a home vegetable garden? And, and that's where there really is very little proof. Yeah. Right. Somebody wants to know about, um, where to go, jays and crows. Um, I see that I'm missing it. Dang. Yeah, there was. Uh, crows and jays who pull out planes or dig into pots. Planes. Planes. Well, I think I'd have the same answer about trying to exclude them if they're pulling out plants. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you know, you, they're, uh, we also are controlled legally by what we can kill in terms of uh, birds. And I don't even like to go there about that information, but I, uh, it, we really in our home gardens can't really kill any bird, um, only in larger agricultural formats can that be done. So I wouldn't even think about that. I would scare them away or exclude them in the ways that we've talked about. You might try with them some of the scaring techniques um, because they're flying. Um, so, you know, something with some eyes on it perhaps could be tried, but again, you'd have to change it out uh, and, and using the flashy materials. There's someone who has ants climbing up her persimmon tree. And I think that has something to do with your aphid talk. It sure does, yeah. Ants climbing up a tree is usually aphid problems. So. Um, and why do ants like aphids? Oh, <laughs> 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 they, the ants actually farm the aphids. So the aphids ex excrete a very sweet syrupy material and they that's what the ants love to eat. Um, so. The best way to control that is to put um, 
some, uh, gee, forgotten what it's called, but something around the base of the tree. Uh, what's it? Some kind of a barrier for the ants around the base of the tree. Do you remember the names of those, Delisa? Mm, Tanglefoot? You're thinking Tanglefoot. Of yeah, Tanglefoot. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Do ants harm gardens? I don't think so. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, anything else? We have to really apologize for the noise. You guys are still hearing it apparently. And um, sorry. So sorry. We're going to figure this out. We promise. <laughs> hey, I wanted to say one other thing that the Master Garden program is going to be doing in the future. First, everybody who signed up for this class is going to be added to our mailing list and will receive notifications when there are plant sales and free classes and events of all kinds. Um, if you don't want to be on that list, you can opt out at any time. But um, we are gearing up for the 2022 Master Gardener training. So keep in touch if you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, because that's going to be right around the corner. OK, I think we may have it. Please do our evaluation. We would appreciate it. And somebody has something nibbling their strawberries and want to know how to find out. Nibbling on the strawberries. Tell I us wouldn't what, be surprised if that's birds. Tell us what the damage looks like. You may unmute. <laughs> Kate, it's Kate. Uh, yes, um, you know, like little chunks, little chunks um, chewed off the edges of the berry, hitting on the berries. That definitely sounds like birds to me. Or small um, children. So. Um, yeah, no, I actually have um, some kind of plastic netting around the bed. Oh. It doesn't cover it completely. Um, and it's also maybe an inch or two at the bottom. Sometimes it, it hikes up. Yep. So if something can jump up onto the raised bed and then go into it, it might. But yeah. I guess also, it's not closed at the top. So I guess birds could be coming in from the top. Right. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. It can be snails. I mean, it could be sl snails and slugs will will pass a little hole in a strawberry if it's laying on the ground. Uh, squirrels will do damage, and of course, birds. Thank you. And how do I find out which of those it is? <laughs> um, you'll want to go out at night with a flashlight to check to see if it's slugs or snails. Uh -huh. And um, you, if you cover it and it stops happening, then oh. it's birds or squirrels. Oh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> good answer, Delisa. Scientific Thank you. method. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Process of elimination. Uh, somebody else has said it could be mice. I suppose that is true. True, too. Everybody likes yeah. a strawberry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK, there's also a newsletter that you're going to be subscribed to um, that you can opt out of, um, and a Facebook page. There's so many ways you can follow us. We will keep you informed. All right, shall we call it a wrap? I think we're calling it a wrap. Thank, Thank you, Trina. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> we learned a lot through this process and look for our future um, virtual classes. We always learn from you guys. Thank you so much. All right, good night. Good night, everybody.